Welcome to the Bald Brad Show. In today's episode, we're covering a variety of different headlines with you. From updates on the Hunter Biden probe, where Hunter Biden's business partner went to the White House a lot more times than what was previously known. We also have updates on illegal immigration and New York City Mayor Eric Adams, as well as The View host, Joy Behar, say asinine things once again. We're going to give you all the details before we jump into any of that. Support a true American patriot by hitting that like and subscribe button. Leave us a short, sweet comment down below. The question for all of you is, do you think Vivek Ramaswamy is going to beat out Ron DeSantis in the polls? Let us know in the comment section below. And also head over to our website, baldbrad.com. Yes, folks, we have a phenomenal website, as Trump would say. A lot of goodies there for you. Uh, it will take you directly to our podcast, Listen Now, which is the audio version of this episode you're listening to. Or if you click Watch Now, it will actually take you directly to our YouTube channel. But up at the top, it says Book. If you click on that, you click on this huge, ginormous book. I don't know how to make it any smaller. Uh, that will get you to purchase a signed copy of my book. Again, Trojan Horse, How the Left is Destroying America. Folks, you're seeing what they're doing in real time. They are utilizing ideology and this evil tactics that we display in the book to destroy this country from the inside out. Find out how, find out why, by purchasing my book, Trojan Horse, How the Left is Destroying America. You can also click on this link down here, and it's going to get you to an unsigned copy of the book and directly take you to Amazon right there. And folks, up at the top, if you click store, we got a phenomenal store, as Trump would say, the best brand you've ever seen other than the Trump brand. No one ever could beat out the Trump Meister. Uh, we just have ones with the logo on the front. Uh, these ones are great, great material. Some of you bought up a couple of those. We got the Bald Brad Show mug with our logo on the front. One thing you can't see is there is an American flag on the back, folks. Nice little gloss mug for you. I gotta be careful because it's filled to the brim of the American brew. And then everything else I kind of designed myself. The American Patriot brand. I freaking love this. I have this shirt at the bottom right that's in red that says American Patriot 1776. The thing is dope, man. I love that shirt. Um, pick up yourself a couple shirts if you want. Uh, there is lady tees, folks. Uh, some of your uh, wives are stealing your mugs. So, heck, get them a t-shirt. Why not? Support them, too, while you're supporting the Bald Brad Show, a fellow conservative. Uh, but again, baldbrad.com, a lot of goodies there for you. I figured I would show you. Normally, I don't ever bring up the actual website, but uh, different times, kind of sponsoring myself a little bit. So sue me. Not really. Don't sue me. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> moving into our first story of the day, we have Hunter Biden's longtime business partner visited the Obama White House multiple times, VP residents more than previously known. So the number of times is gonna, you're going to fall over in your chair because it was only reported that maybe he went there like three or four times and one was like to a dinner and then like he did like a tour around the White House and then maybe met with the VP once. Folks, I, I've said time and time again, the more evidence that comes out, it, it's just insane that the longer this goes on, the amount of evidence that we have and we continue to get, but nothing happens. So Hunter Biden's former business partner and friend visited the Obama White House and then Vice President Joe Biden's residence dozens of times, not a dozen times, dozens of times between 2009 and 2016. The reason why that's important is because this is when a lot of this stuff took place in terms of the alleged embezzlement, funneling of money to their shell companies, receiving money from China, Romania, Ukraine. All this kind of took place in 2009 and 2016. And to get even more specific than that, from 2014 to fall of 2015, that was when Hunter Biden was being looked into by Shokin, the Ukrainian prosecutor that was fired by then president of Ukraine, I believe. And that was called for by vice president of the time, Joe Biden. And Joe Biden was going, well, you're not going to get a billion dollars of loan money unless you fire that guy. And the president was like, well, he's done nothing wrong, but I guess we'll fire him anyways. And a lot of people are saying quid pro quo. What the left is saying about the quid pro quo was Joe Biden never received something. So it couldn't have been a quid pro quo. Now, I think there could be something a little bit more to that in the sense of Joe Biden could have received something. What we know, I don't know yet, but uh, there's a lot of damning evidence here going against the Biden family nonetheless. So likely to make him the next target of the House Oversight Committee's investigation into Hunter Biden's foreign business dealings. Fox News Digital previously reported that Eric Sherwin had visited the White House and vice presidential residence of Observatory Circle at least 27 times 
during Joe Biden's vice presidency. However, a more extensive review found that Sherwin actually made at least 36 visits during the same time frame. Remember, it's not just Devin Archer that was in business with the Biden family, specifically Hunter Biden. You also have here Eric Sherwin. Now, this might get confusing because even the GOP is saying this thing is a spider web. I mean, there's money funneling from everywhere, going in every which direction, and then it's going to take a long time to unravel this bad boy. The reason why this is also important is why are they going to the White House in the first place, and why are they there 36 times or 37 times, however many, if Joe Biden is going to say that he knew nothing about Hunter Biden's business dealings, like Hunter Biden's business at all. And that's why the White House came out, and we covered it here, where Real Clear Politics White House correspondent reporter Philip Wegman asked the question of why was there a language change of you basically saying you knew nothing about the business dealings or Hunter Biden's business at all to like, well, he knew something about Hunter Biden's business dealings in a nutshell. So uh, the language was really weird on it, but you're seeing this kind of narrative start to change from the White House itself, which tells you that there's something there. Sherwin was the founding partner and managing director of Hunter Biden's now dissolved firm Rosemont Senseca Partners when he was appointed by then President Obama to the Commission for the Preservation of Americans Heritage Board uh, Abroad. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So <laughs> you have Rose Rosemont Senseca, which Devin Archer was a part of, Hunter Biden was a part of, and Eric Sherwin was a part of. What was believed was money was being funneled from China, Romania, Ukraine, uh, into basically Burisma Holdings, which was the natural gas company of Hunter Biden and, and Devin Archer. Well, they were taking that money and funneling it into Rosemont Senseca, where Eric Sherwin was the, I guess, the managing director of the whole thing as well. So now you're seeing how the, all this stuff is connected. And again, it's a spider web, but you're seeing kind of the funnel. And that's the thing that the GOP is doing here. They're following the money to see where this all leads. And you're hoping one of these dominoes falls here. And it sounds like they're kind of falling with these two business partners of Hunter Biden. It's a little awkward and a little weird here that you have the managing director of this firm all of a sudden being appointed by President Obama to the Commission for the Preservation of America's Heritage Abroad. Interesting. An independent U.S. government agency. Obama reappointed him to the commission in January 2017. So there was speculation that Obama knows about this stuff. And it wouldn't surprise him because the Obama administration did lie. This is displayed so perfectly in Ben Shapiro's book, The People vs. Barack Obama, where his attorney general, Eric Holder, of the time lied about a multitude of things. And Obama goes on a multitude of things. Well, I knew nothing about it. But there was emails like actual correspondence between Obama and his uh, gen uh, his his attorney attorney general Eric uh, Eric Holder saying, "Look, uh, we we know about this. You're having correspondence about. It. Of course, you know about it." But uh, that's for a later video. We have talked about that in the past. Again, that's People vs. Barack Obama uh, by Ben Shapiro. It is you guys would really enjoy that book. Uh, so much so, uh, I'll leave a link in the description below if I remember. Quote: Eric asked for one of these. For one of these, the day after the election in 2008, Hunter Biden revealed about Sherwin's initial appointment in an email on March 13th, 2015. The number of Sherwin's White House visits could be much higher than 36 if any of his meetings fell under the White House voluntary disclosure policy exception of purely personal guests due to his handling of the Biden family's personal finances. Now you're kind of seeing as well why this guy is kind of important because if he's handling the Biden's personal finances... He's going to know where a lot of this stuff goes and the funneling of it. You get this guy to crack. I think that's where the cookie crumbles, folks. The White House will not release access records related to purely personal guests of the first and second families, i.e. visits that do not involve any official or political business, the Obama administration's archive website says. One of Sherwin's visits in November 2010 was a sit down with Joe Biden in the West Wing. Sherwin also visited Joe Biden's residence at least 15 times for various holiday receptions, including the December 12th holiday reception in 2015 that came a couple of days after then Vice President Biden's infamous trip to Ukraine, where he threatened to withhold a billion dollars in U.S. aid if the country's leaders did not fire their top prosecutors. I mean, I've said it time and time again. You guys know I've said it time and time again. The amount of evidence that that the government has here on Joe Biden as well as Hunter Biden, heck, the Biden family, 
and they're not willing to really look under the hood is pretty crazy. Attorney General uh, Barr, who was the attorney general under the Trump administration, was questioned recently. I don't know if it was on Fox News or what website. Basically saying, you know, why, why didn't you go after like Hunter Biden? Why didn't you start like a, an actual investigation? And his his thinking was interesting. He was saying that basically he believed that the investigation would have been shut down. He believes that there would have been a conflict of interest as the administrations were moving from the Trump administration to the Biden administration. And that was going to be kind of a call that Attorney General Merrick Garland would have had to make. So I think there is some truth to it, but it doesn't look good that, you know, a Republican administration wasn't willing to look at Hunter Biden. And now you have a Democrat administration that's not willing to look under Hunter Biden, but they're going to spend both under Republican administration as well as a Democrat administration going after Trump. It just seems corrupt to a lot of people. Lady Justice doesn't seem to be wearing a blindfold right now, or if she is, she's only wearing it with the Democrats rather than the Republicans. And we see it time and time again. Check this out. The elder Biden was photographed at a December 12, 2015 party by a former Senate staffer who was confirmed via the White House visitor logs as attending the holiday party. Also in 2015 of April, one month after his appointment in U.S. government, Sherwin visited Biden's residence for what the visitor logs labeled as a meeting. So, there could be a lot of stuff here. We will see. It's going to take some time. I wish it would move faster. Um, but uh, uh, kind of a speculation or conspiracy theories. A lot of people think a lot of this information is going to come out sometime next year. And that's where the Democrats are going to cave on Joe Biden. Joe Biden isn't going to run again. And so they're going to prop somebody else up. Who that is. RFK isn't looking too good with Democrats. It seems like uh, they're censoring the guy. Um you have, uh, who's that knucklehead? Gavin Newsom from my state. That guy's not, can't put that guy's president, man. No way. I mean, he is worse than Kamala Harris. And I mean, that's saying something. I mean, the guy has drove California into the ground. But I've also said this in the past. For some reason, I don't know what it is. But if you are really bad at your job, regardless of whether you're Republican or Democrat, for some reason, you get propped up in, in high levels of our government. I don't know what it is. It's like the reversal of what you should do, right? Where if you are really good at your job. That's what should advance you. But for some reason in politics, if you're really bad at your job, that's what really advances you. What history tells us. I mean, look, look at who's been president. I mean, come on, come on. All right. <laughs> Moving into our next segment here, Mexico links Texas border buoys to migrant deaths. Abbott says that's flat out wrong. So I'm interested to hear uh, Abbott's take on this, but I think the buoys are a good thing. Before they were complaining about migrants cutting themselves on razor wire, trying to come into the country. But if you put your hand on a hot stove, it's not the person's fault that installed the stove that you burned your hand on the stove. I mean, you're the one that did it in the same way. You shouldn't be blaming uh, Eric Adams or not Eric Adams, uh, Greg Abbott or others for putting razor wire along the border. I mean, you're the one that decided to walk through razor wire. What would you expect? It's razor for a reason. So Democrats are finding any way they can to blame Republicans for this border and how they can keep it open by saying it's closed and all these other things. Texas Republican Governor Greg Abbott rebuffed claims from the Mexican government that pinned the deaths of migrants this week on a buoy barrier installed by his state in the Rio Grande. Two bodies, likely of migrants attempting to illegally cross the U.S. border, were found Wednesday, one of which was recovered near the buoys in the river that are a part of Abbott's newly installed border barrier. The Mexican government was the first to inform the public about the incident and linked the deaths to the buoys after which Abbott's office rejected the explanation. I mean, how do they know though? Just because a body in a moving river shows up next to buoys that are going to block things, isn't it possible that the body could have perished at some point anywhere else in the river and then got strung up onto the buoys as it was floating down? The Mexican government is flat out wrong, said Abbott's spokesperson according to the Washington Examiner. To be clear, preliminary information points to the drowning occurring before the body was even near the barriers. There you go. The Texas Department of Public Safety previously reported to Border Patrol the dead body floating upstream from the barriers in the Rio Grande. The Mexican Ministry of Foreign Affairs said that it was notified by the Texas Department of Public Safety about a lifeless body caught in the southern part of the buoys. You have a uh, Texas DPS Lieutenant Chris Oliveras, however, said the river stream moved the dead body down into the buoys. That was my speculation. Explained that the buoy did not lead to the death. The thousand foot 
stretch of buoys is placed in a shallow area where it is easy to cross the river, according to Alvarez. Uh, I do have a picture of kind of what that looks like, the buoys itself. It doesn't string the whole river, but uh, clearly people are <laughs> people are somehow going around it. So I don't know how well it's actually working or if, I mean, it has to be on the U.S. side, right? Because that's where the razor wire is. But um, they're just going to complain about this. I think Greg Abbott is doing everything he possibly can to try and solve this issue. But the White House, the White House is trying to say that they're fixing it by doing everything they can. Joe Biden's losing sleep over it. I mean, this has been going on long enough. We know they're not going to fix anything. And when they do fix something, they're going to take credit for it by implementing some sort of policy or rule. But they're not going to actually tell us which policy or rule under which administration they're going to re-implement it under. That's a fancy way of saying they re-implemented Trump's policies and they don't want to be called racist, sexist, big homophobes, all those words from their own base because they're reinstituting Trump's policy. So they're just going to say they instituted a rule or a prior policy. Well, we also have Senator Tim Scott here slamming Biden over the conditions just at the southern border. Remember when AOC went down there and like fabricated all these photos and Democrats are taking photos left and right. AOC was actually fabricating photos by going to empty parking lots with like a chain link fence, but there was nobody on the other side and she's just like screaming to the wind. Uh, well, you also had her saying that migrants were drinking out of toilets. They're drinking toilet water. And what you had was the basically the faucet, the, the fountain was at the top and then the toilet was down at the bottom. And everybody knows that our toilet water here in America is the same water that comes out of your faucet. Like it's all the same water. Uh, nobody was scooping a cup out of the actual bowl of the toilet and drinking it. It's all funneled through the same thing. That's how clean our water is. Our toilet water is cleaner than Mexico's actual water. And that's not me like bashing Mexico. It's just a pure fact. So that's what the Democrats are doing. All the while, Joe Biden under COVID was tossing migrants into these in these cages, we'll call them. They, they called them pods. They just switched the word. They were cages. Um, and, and, and just blowing them out. I mean, they could they, they were packing. Let's say a pod was like 150. I can't remember the actual capacity of the pod, but let's say it was 150 people. I mean, they were throwing people in there like three times as much. There was like 250 people, 300, 350 at a time. And the CDC was only allowing 50% capacity, meaning they were over exceeding that during the time of COVID. Remember COVID, the thing that was going to kill everybody, regardless of whether you had it or not, to where like Fauci wanted you to triple mask, get like eight booster shots and all these other things. But you need to listen to the World Health Organization that was in bed with the Chinese as well as Fauci was and all these other things. Again, another video, folks. I'm just ranting and raving here. But uh it's all, it's all, it's all foo foo. It's all scuff, scuff, scuffle. The Democrats don't want to solve this issue, and you know, honestly, Republicans don't really want to solve it either. Republicans could have done a lot of things when Trump was in office. I granted there was a little window there, but they still didn't do it. So Republicans are to blame for this just as much as everybody else is. In the same way, the Dem the, the Republicans are to blame with our spending as much as Democrats are. So there is blame to be had. I do think before you before you get all crazy with me uh, i do think that republicans do handle things a little bit better like illegal illegal immigration than do democrats i'm fully on board with that i'm just saying there was a lot of solving that could have been done over the course of decades with republicans in terms of solving this issue everybody would have to agree with that and that goes on both sides it goes on democrats and and republican side i was hounded the democrats because they had an opportunity for 2 years to solve this issue and they didn't and then they're blaming it when Republicans are in Congress going, well, they, they need to have a backbone. They need to have courage to solve this issue. That comes from Kareem jean here, White House press secretary. So there were times over decades that Republicans could have solved this issue. They didn't. I mean, Trump tried his best. Remember, Democrats were Democrats were in Congress, so it's a little tough going up against them. I think he did everything he could. But, um, you know, there's, bl there's blame to be had on both sides. At the end of the day. That's all I'm saying. Senator Tim Scott criticized the Biden administration during an interview this week over the poor conditions on the southern border. I mean, it's it's bad down there. I've seen I've seen video uh, from from people that are connected down there. It is it is insane. I saw it at its peak. I've never seen lines any longer. I've never seen so many thousands upon thousands of people just somewhere other than like Disneyland. <laughs> The Republican presidential candidate made the remarks during an interview with Fox News while he was visiting the U.S.-Mexico border on Friday. He said, quote, the biggest difference between 2019 and now, two words, Joe Biden, Scott said, when you have a president who unleashes a wide open, unsafe, insecure border, we cannot be surprised by more than 6 million illegal crossings. However, the devastation of 70,000 Americans who lost their lives to fentanyl because Joe Biden refuses to close our southern border. Preventable. As president of the United States, I will finish the wall and I will use the available technology to surveil 
our border to stop fentanyl from killing another 70,000 Americans in the next 12 months. Here's the thing, and this is one thing I wanted to spotlight, and I was actually going to do this yesterday on Sunday. But as you can tell, I'm still like, I got a lot going on right now with work and and keep getting sick and all these other things. Uh, let me take a little swig of my coffee out of my mug. What I what I don't like about these politicians, and this is going to sound bad. It almost seems like I'm just hounding Republicans today, kind of too. <laughs> That's not my intention. Is politicians and Trump isn't a politician. I don't think he is, but politicians, they say things, but they're never specific. You guys, like, how are you going to do that? You just go, well, I, I'm, I'm just going to, I'm going to figure out the border. I'm going to use available technology to surveil the border. Where do you have available technology? Honestly, the Biden, actually the Biden administration is doing that. They're just, they're just not, they're just, they're utilizing technology not to stop the problem. They're just like watching people come across the border. The reason I want to bring this up is Vivek Ramaswamy, you guys, is really growing on me. Like, I'm a big Trump fan and even obviously DeSantis fan. Right now, it pretty much is going Trump, Ramaswamy, DeSantis for me. The reason why is Vivek isn't a politician in the same way Trump isn't. But if you listen to that guy talk, I've been watching all his town halls. The guy's everywhere, everywhere. More than Trump is, more than, definitely more DeSantis is. I mean, DeSantis is, where is he? I don't know what his campaign is doing. But Vivek is so clear, you guys. I mean, he will give you point by point what his plan is. Honestly, I don't even see that from Trump. Trump will say the same thing as uh, Scott here of like, oh, well, I'm going to solve the border. I want you to be specific. I like Trump, you guys. But if he's not going to be specific and I got a guy that's running for office that has a detailed plan and is willing to reveal that detailed plan to me and not just say something very big and promise it, um, I'm more inclined to believe like, hey, if he has a plan, well, let's follow suit with it. How many how many presidents have we gone through, you guys, that just say things? Regardless of Democrat or Republicans, they just say things, but then then we get screwed at the end of the day because we believe that big promise, but never do they actually reveal like, well, what is your actual plan for this thing while they're running? They're like, oh, well, I'll promise this and they'll figure out the plan on the back end. I just don't like that. It might, let me know. You guys are all Republicans and conservatives for the most part. Some of you are probably independent. Heck, there might be a Democrat that weaseled their way in here and welcome. Does it bug you when, when politicians do that? Because it does to me. Regardless of who it is, whether I like them or not. Again, I, I can't emphasize enough. I'm a Trump's fan. Just because I'm a fan of somebody doesn't mean I can't bash him every now and then. In the same way that you have friends, but I'm sure you bash your friend every now and then for doing something stupid or you don't like something that they do, but they're still your friend. We do those family members all the time with people that we love. It doesn't mean you're trying to be harsh or, or or mean to them or anything of that sort. But I think sometimes I get nervous when I kind of hound Trump because people go, oh, well, you're hounding Trump, so you're not a Trump supporter, all these other things. I can, I'm a registered Republican. I can hound Trump and I will continue to hound Trump, especially if he gets back in office. When he does something stupid and I'm going to tell everybody when he does something good. I mean, that's how things work, right? I mean, we do that with the Biden administration. They just do a lot of things bad, but there are some things that he's done that's good, few and far between. But again, the question for all of you is, and I, I'm really curious, does it bug you guys? Because it does me when somebody's not specific and they just promise me something willy nilly and then, you know, oh, well, uh, we'll figure it out later. Let me know. I, I do read the comments, you guys. I do. You'll see me hard it, like it. I read it or in the live chat as well. Scott said that local law enforcement has told him that the continued surge in illegal immigration has devastated their communities. Oh yeah. Remember Texas is footing the bill for all this. It has to, the person that's running the Texas budget, you guys, that person should be, that person should be in office like, to figure out the budget for that federal government because these guys are getting hounded, hounded in terms of money and the, and the Biden administration won't pay them back. So Biden administration causes the issue, but won't pay them to, uh, basically figure out this whole thing in their local communities. Quote, the devastation that we are experiencing as Americans is preventable. Much of it is preventable if we finish the wall. Use technology, fire Joe Biden, and hire me, he said. <laughs> I will be the president that finishes the wall and takes seriously the opportunity to send save tens of thousands of Americans from the drug of fentanyl. I love that he wants to build a wall. I do think that's a huge issue. We need to build a wall and we can work uh, around everything else after that. But get more technology, more border patrol agents, but more importantly, get that wall down there and secure the border. Make things harder for people to come across. Just don't have open borders where people can walk across a river or a puddle and uh, just come into our country. And the reason why, actually, I don't know the reason why. I don't know why our friends on the other side of the aisle, Democrats, the left, they get so upset and just go, well, we just need to allow these people into the interior of the country. You know, they want to have a better life. I 100% agree they want a better life. I mean, some of them would assimilate really well into America, I am sure. 
but there's a process. And when you break down processes, that's when society and civilization does fall apart. You don't have to look any further than New York City, Los Angeles. I mean, look at the crippling and the devastation of not following rules, laws, and regulations, the impact that it has on areas. And when you have millions of people pouring across the border, if you just told everybody open borders, you're not looking at 3 million. I mean, you're looking at 100 million people, probably plus wanting to pour into the United States. I just don't think it's right to cut lines. But put it this way, put it this way. I mean, it's a terrible analogy, but you're in line, say, for hours waiting for something, whether it's food, a movie ticket, heck, I don't know. And you see somebody cut that line in front of you, regardless of whether you're Democrat or Republican, you're going to be pissed. You waited in line for so long in the heat or whatever it may be to get in to whatever event or said thing you're purchasing and somebody just cuts the line in front of you. Of course, you're going to be mad, but just take that same level and put it into something extremely important where people around the world are paying money. They're waiting in line to get into our country. And you just have people going, well, screw you. I'm just going to come through the Southern border. and I'm going to walk in to me. That's not right. Regardless, both people struggling in their countries, both people having a very hard time. Both people want to have the American dream. One person is doing it right. The other person is breaking the law by coming here illegally. I, I just, I, I, I try, you have a heart of empathy for both heart of sympathy for both as well. Like you want them both to have a better life. Of course you do. You're an American, but somehow Republicans, we get painted as these evil people and we don't want to be evil people. We want the best for a lot of people, but we also understand that there is a way that society is ran and there's a way that things need to be ran. And this is one of them. But when you have people that are just willing to cut across and, you know, file for asylum that most majority don't even meet asylum. To me, it's just wrong. I don't agree with it. I want these people to have a better life. I want these people to be able to come and have a, a great opportunity to the American dream, but there's a way to do it. That's all I'm saying. And I'm telling, I'm so tired of Republicans just getting painted as these evil racist people when they're not the major, a lot of, I would say, I'd say Republicans and conservatives are more religious than actual Democrats and people on the progressive left side of the aisle. I mean, some people would argue that like Dennis Prager, because maybe the left is more religious than the actual right, because they're not willing to actually question their own ideology and the tactics that they're utilizing to cripple this, cripple this country from the inside out. Whereas at least Christians and, and, and Catholics usually have this debate in their head in terms of religion and, and fighting and struggling with God and, and, and figure out, you know, do I really believe this? Do I not? And, you know, having that fight every now and then with oneself, but um, you know, that's for a random tangent. All I'm saying is, it's just frustrating where we're at as a country where we keep labeling Republicans and conservatives evil for wanting to do the right thing, which is to follow the law. Scott said that he was not discouraged by a recent poll from the New York Times that showed former President Donald Trump at 54 percent, Florida Governor Ron DeSantis at 17 percent and everyone else at 3 percent or less. I thought Vivek Ramaswamy was higher than that. I'm pretty sure Vivek was at like five or six percent or something like that. He is climbing. Um, and I think you guys should really give him a listen. Really? I know that Ron DeSantis, a lot of us like him. I know a lot of us like Donald Trump, but um, I wouldn't point you towards Ramaswamy if I didn't think that he was really worth your time of listening to his town halls and just what the guy has to say. I think you really will be impressed. Um, but uh, that's what's going on with... Uh, <laughs> that's what's going on with uh, uh, the southern border down there with the buoys and everything else. Uh, I'm going to have to kind of deviate from one of my articles here really quick where uh, we have Chicago mayor worries that they're being too mean uh, with, with thugs there at the, uh, at the border. So we'll maybe come back to that one in a second, unless I can get logged in here. Okay, here we go. All right. So <laughs> I haven't read this again. I had to log in. I just saw, I just saw the headline Chicago mayor worries that we're being too mean to thugs terrorizing his city. Oh my gosh. <laughs> we're going to try to get this without uh, laughing too hard. Two years ago, a 20-year-old student at the University of Chicago named Max Lewis boarded a subway car on the city's Green Line. Lewis had just finished another day interning at an investment bank in downtown Chicago, and he was on his way back to his apartment. Then, without warning, a stray bullet tore through the subway's car's window and hit Lewis in the neck. Doctors quickly determined that Max Lewis had been paralyzed from the neck down. He'd never be able to ever eat or walk again. He need a ventilator forever, but Lewis could communicate with his eyes by blinking and using a letter board. He sent this message to his family. If I have to live like this, pull the plug, please. Seriously. Doctors took Matt Lewis off of life support and he died in the hospital shortly afterwards. It's a horrifying story, but it's not particularly unusual in Chicago. 
The same weekend that Max Lewis was shot in the neck, at least 100 other residents of Chicago were hit by gunfire, and 18 died. A few days later, Chicago mayor, at the time Lori Lightfoot, gave an extended interview with CNN in Chicago's West Garfield Park neighborhood. She was surrounded by bodyguards for the long, for the whole thing. Similar to what we see when the Democrats wanted to, um, you know, abolish the police or dearm the police or defund the police, but yet they have bodyguards and secret service members and Capitol police officers like everywhere, like littered around them. The same way they, they don't want to build a border wall, but there was a wall around the Capitol. Go figure. Lori Lightfoot did not offer any sympathy to the family of Max Lewis, nor did she propose any solution to the city's rampant, basically rampant crime problem. I mean, it's rampant. I don't even know if it's a good word anymore. It's insane. Instead, in the interview, Lori Lightfoot made it clear who the real victim was in Chicago. It was Lori Lightfoot. I'm a black woman and I'm a member of the LGBTQ community, she said. I'm not okay with systemic racism, homophobia, and sexism. Still exists, but I'm going to play the cards that I am dealt. Which is, it's a victim card at the end of the day. I mean, all those things are true, right? She is a black woman. She is a member of the LGBTQ community. But the part that isn't true is, well, there is, I don't believe there's any systemic racism anymore. Is there racism out there? Yes. As far as the systems that are built, I don't know what systems they're talking about. They just shout something big in the sky of like, there's systemic racism out there. Well, what systems, who implemented those systems and how are those systems ultimately racist in in a nutshell, I don't know. I, I'm still waiting. Homophobia and sexism, all these other things. So again, not taking responsibility for one's action is the problem here. This pattern repeated in Chicago over and over again for years until finally the residents of Chicago had enough with Lori Lightfoot's mal, basically malviolence and incompetence. Early this year, Lightfoot became the first mayor of Chicago to lose re-election in 40 years. Lori Lightfoot's replacement was a former social studies teacher named Brandon Johnson. Like every other mayor elected in Chicago since 1927, Brandon Johnson is a Democrat. Man, they've elected Democrats for 100 years straight. Did you guys know that? Like every other mayor elected in Chicago since 1927, they've all been Democrats? I mean, if you wanted to have any sort of argument with how the left are destroying America, which we have a book here, uh, talk about Chicago, man. <laughs> hey, hey, there you go. I, I'm blown away. During the campaign, Johnson did not propose any serious solutions to the rampant crime in Chicago. Of course he didn't. This is literally the definition of insanity, right? Doing the same thing over again, expecting different results, except they've been doing it for a hundred years. I don't even think maybe insanity is the right word for it. I've said it time and time again. If you are a Democrat, you're an American, right? We want we want the best for the American people in general. There's different pathways of going about this. I think the Democrat side of the aisle went the wrong pathway. I think Republicans have the right pathway. More police, locking people up, being serious about crime, you know, not allowing people to, you know, have no cash bail and just allow, allowing them to go back in the streets to commit more crime. Be serious about this because Democrats are being harmed by this too. It's not just Republicans, it's Democrats as well. It's a Democrat elected area and you're having people killing other Democrats. It's Democrats killing Democrats in the same way it's blacks killing blacks, whites killing whites, Asians killing Asians, Hispanics killing Hispanics. Like it's, it's, it's crime on crime. It's, it's people going after the same people, Chicagoans going after Chicagoans and, and they keep voting for it. I don't get it. Just vote Republican. Just band together, just band together for like, give it a decade. You've been doing this for a hundred years. It's good. hundred years of this is crippling. It's going to take a long time to get a Republican in office to help fix this problem. Mayor Rudy Giuliani did it in New York. He actually turned the crime way around. If you recall, New York was ran by Democrats. It was riddled with crime. You had Mayor Giuliani come in and he cleaned up the mess that he was known for because he was harsh on crime. You need this in Chicago, man. I'm trying to appease to the Democrat side of the aisle. That's all I'm trying to do. I'm trying to change the tone of rhetoric to just meet in the middle somewhere of like, dude, just be harsh on crime, maybe. I don't know, get more police officers. During the campaign, Johnson did not propose any serious solutions to the rampant crime in Chicago. Instead, he ran a platform of anti-white racism and defunding the police department. <laughs> you guys here with me still? I hope so. I don't want to be in here by myself, even if there's just one of you. I can't go through this myself. <laughs> 
Oh my god. I'm gonna reread it just because it's it's just so insane. It said he ran on a platform of anti-white racism and defunding the police department. Brandon Johnson took office just over two months ago. One of the first major tests of his new administration came on Sunday night when a mob began looting stores, fighting in public, and destroying property in the South Loop. This is considered one of the nicer areas of the city for what it's worth. The bar is pretty low, admittingly. Here's what it looked like this weekend. Uh, you guys, I want to show you the video, but for some reason, I'm getting flagged on this stuff, so I can't show the video. It's just people fighting in the streets, acting act, act like knuckleheads, looting one another, and all this crazy stuff. And it's mostly teens, by the way. Notice the media calls this a teen takeover, which is maybe the most innocuous possible term they could use. It sounds like a birthday party at a local swimming pool. <laughs> in reality, as anyone can see it, it was rioting. Yes, it was. It's the same way when MSNBC reporters like, ah, oh, it's mostly peaceful, nothing big here. There's maybe a couple of spurts of fires here and there. The whole city's ablaze behind the guy, just billions of dollars being burned to the ground. <laughs> Many of them were... But certainly not all of them. At least one journalist didn't want to whitewash this complete breakdown of public safety in America's major cities. The reporter asked Brandon Johnson what he was going to do about the mob violence in the South Loop. Brandon Johnson responded by attacking the reporter's choice of language. Let's uh, let's see it. Also at 4.30, Chicago Mayor Brandon Johnson opening up on everything from the migrant crisis to teen takeovers. Since he took office in May, he hasn't fielded questions from reporters very often. Among those asking them today, CBS2 political investigator Dana Kozloff. And Dana, Mayor Johnson spent about an hour talking with the press. Yeah, Jim and Marie, and the most recent incident of teenagers and young adults converging and overwhelming in one area of the city was a big topic of conversation. It just happened this past weekend. And in that instance, they caused a lot of damage. The mayor responded this way, though, when someone characterized it as mob action. That's not appropriate. We're not talking about mob actions. I didn't say that. What, what I, okay, what I'm... Hold on a second, okay? Respectfully, these large gatherings... That damage. These large gatherings, just hold on a second, y'all. I promise you, we have time to talk. It's important that we speak of these dynamics in an appropriate way. This is not to obfuscate what is actually taking place. This was the scene near Roosevelt and Canal Sunday night. Groups looted a convenience store. More than three dozen teenagers were arrested along with a 12-year-old and at least one 20-year-old. Store owners say it was the... It's just a gathering, you guys. Don't worry about it. It's just a big gathering. The second such incident in that area in just the past few weeks. And today, Mayor Johnson commended Chicago police for the way they handled it. To the best of their ability, I believe that they attempted to engage with our young people, with community partners, giving as much warning as they possibly could. And, you know, unfortunately, arrests, you know, were made. And unfortunately, some damage was, was caused. And... The level of sensitivity and patience that our officers expressed, I'm appreciative of that. It's, it's wild, man. It, I mean, it's wild. How else can you port it? <laughs> it's, just, it's just a gathering. It's just a gathering. <laughs> Literally ransacking stores, breaking windows. Oh, God. Uh, you can't make this up, folks. You can't make this up. So that's what's going on in Chicago. There's a lot of videos here that are linked in the article. And, uh, well, we can't show it because we'll get flagged on YouTube. We'll get flagged on YouTube. Well, <laughs> if that wasn't crazy enough, talking about mayors and cities, uh, Mayor Eric Adams of New York City suggests outside agitators involved in New York City's influencer uh, riot. So this kind of made airwaves probably friday to sunday or saturday and sunday where you had this social media influencer kai i think his name is I i'm not too familiar with him but um i guess he was doing something where he wanted to organize a giveaway and a bunch of people showed up and a lot of crime happened so i'm gonna go through this with you and uh i might do a side video on it just kind of talking about my thoughts about the whole thing as well 
New York City Mayor Eric Adams on Saturday suggested that the riot involved thousands of young people that unfolded in Manhattan Union Square could have been driven by outside agitators. Asked about the incident sparked by what intended to be PlayStation giveaway organized by Twitch influencer Kai Sinat, Sinat? during an unrelated press conference, Adams referenced this influencer, noting that he had a substantial number of followers and people came from outside of the city to be there. Quote, we are looking further into where there were there even some outside agitators basically taking place. You don't come to get basically freeing Game Boys and bringing smoke bombs and bring M80s and bring other disruptive items, Adam said, mentioning a different video gaming system. We believe there were some outside influencers that may have attempted to aggravate the situation. The influencer is 21 years old who boasts more than 13 million followers across the platforms that include Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitch had advertised basically giveaway for PlayStation for people to show up. Video circulated. This is kind of just one picture. I don't want to play the video again because YouTube is flagging me left and right for like anything and everything. It's frustrating as heck, but I don't want to complain. That's for a different time. Um, you see people stomping on random cars. I mean, they were bending hoods, uh, scraping the cars, throwing stuff at it, just trashing people's stuff, left and right property, robbing places, looting, um, breaking people's windows, attacking restaurant owners and, and people just nearby. And you just have all these teenagers filming it. They got the masks on and all this other stuff. I mean, it's, it's inappropriate. It's wrong. And you know, you're going to sugarcoat this stuff. Maybe, maybe this is just, this is just a, you know, it was just a beat up. It was just a beat up. So, uh, here's, I'm hesitant to play it, but maybe, maybe we'll try to give it a go. So this is what it looks like. Um, I'm gonna try to keep it small. Maybe that will help. I don't want to max it out to full picture, but I mean, there is thousands of people in the streets. Look at all the look. Just look at all the trash that is there. Th these are clearly people that don't care. Um, all the while, you know, when these people grow up, they're gonna vote. They're, they're you know, these are the same people that are talking about climate change and all these other things. Probably, heck, I don't know. And uh, it, it's just sad where we're at as a society, especially with these teenagers, man. Where are these people's parents at? That's my question. My, my, if I just went like, oh, there was a, even if, right? Even if I said, oh, it's my parents. Hey, there was a giveaway and they let me go. The second I saw crowds like this, honestly, I probably would have left. The reason why is my grandmother always used to say, it's better be safe than sorry. And I know when crowds start developing like this, anything could happen, especially when there's no security or there's really no organization around. Um, that something like something bad could happen, especially with what's going on in today's society in terms of when mobs get together like this, usually things do go south. So, um, you know, it's just a gathering though, you guys, just a gathering. And according to Mayor Eric Adams, uh, just outside agitators involved in all this. No big deal though. Well, if that wasn't the only asinine thing from Chicago mayor to New York City mayor, you got Joy Behar once again saying mega rich leftist Joy Behar actually saying economy is booming. People are having an easier time putting bread on the table in defense of Biden. It's exhausting. I really wish like. <laughs> I really wish we were like all in the same room together. So that I could see your guys' reactions when I read headlines like that. You know what I mean? Like, I have a reaction. I've always said majority, vast majority of the stuff I haven't read. I see a headline. I'm like, this this has to be good. It has to be good. <laughs> it's Joy Behar. I mean, how could it not? But when I read these headlines or I go through some of the stories, I really wish, like, I could see your face and what you're saying. It would be funny. It would be funny to see you <laughs> spitting out your coffee, cussing up a storm in your house or your apartment, wherever you're at, your room. All right. Well, <laughs> leftist Joy Behar reportedly earns seven million annually as a co seven. She earns seven million dollars a year. Oh my God. Earn 7 million annually. It said, it says how great the American dream is. Is that not, is that not telling you how great the American dream is that you don't need to know anything and get paid $7 million to not know nothing. She gets paid 7 million annually. It's a co-host on the view. She gets paid more, she makes more than the president.
not speaking much with Joe Biden in office, but she's speaking more of the president. The View said on Friday's program that the economy is booming and people are having an easier time putting bread on the table in a passionate defense for Joe Biden. Oh, we have a clip. Oh, we have a clip for you, folks. Let me cue it up for you. Let's do it. Well, everything Joe Biden, is- let me just say something about Joe Biden. According to what I'm observing, the economy is booming. Yeah. Inflation is down. The stock market is doing well. Uh, people are having an easier time putting bread on the table, etc. <laughs> he doesn't seem to be getting the credit for that. Only 41% approval. Is it because they think he's old? Because I don't see anything else they can point to with, with him particularly. Well, it's a question for Democrats. But I think well, no, it's a question for you, really, because what? you said you would not well, vote she's not for voting. No, for not, no, 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 but you said you would so not vote for my vote, vote. One vote. Um, I, I Every would, vote not, counts, and your vote counts, and I'm going to tell you, why, to you again, but I know you don't want to hear it. Why do Dem- a candidate why is your one candidate, of you at a time, please. Why is your candidate not doing better with Democrats? That's but, who he needs but, to win. But yeah. Yeah. Moderate because they think voters. he's old. That's why. No, I mean, well, that's Trump, because Trump is old. No, listen, but he's not, listen, 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 you I am the same age as Joe Biden is not doing poorly because I won't vote for Joe Biden. Let me just make that question clear. You have to, at one point, you you guys, can I just, oh, it's chaos. I mean, it's the view. Of course, it's chaos. And so is this country right now, as we've seen. <laughs> so, so what are the details of all this? As you saw, that came from Newsbusters and noted that Behar flipped out after hearing about a new, t- new York Times slash Siena poll that found former President Trump could possibly beat Biden in 2024. I mean, enjoy Behar had to like lose it, right? I mean, this lady got all excited because she said Joe Biden works out every morning. The same guy that trips over sandbags, falls up a flight of stairs multiple times, trips over a rock, a blade of grass. But yeah, he exercises. Sure. So <clears throat> how are folks reacting? So Real Clear Politics ran a piece on Behar's claims and commentators were aghast about the whole thing. So I want to go through a couple of these with you. <laughs> Let's just pull it up. Well, 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 Joy Behar's let them eat cake, let them eat cake moment right on the table is probably all the average folks can afford these days. Not wrong. Must be nice to be a dried up communist raking in seven figures for doing nothing but spewing lies, propaganda, and censorship on behalf of the Democrat Party's communist dictatorship. Where's the lie? Where's the lie? This is the same line of kind of logic of when Bernie Sanders said that bread lines were good. And somehow people are just, you know, it's just so easy to get bread on the table nowadays. I mean, it is easy to get bread on the table. I mean, you could make it yourself, but that, that you understand the point that's being made. This woman is a joke, another commenter said. I'm retired and on a budget. The price of gas has doubled in the past three years at my gas station. My grocery bill is 25% higher and the cost of other services is a minimum 20% higher. And she thinks I'm having an easier time putting bread on the table. This is a prime example of Democrat thought. The problem is it is not true. Last person said, was this recorded in early 2020? Another commentator asked. It certainly bears no resemblance to the... Xi Jiden, this is supposed to be like like Xi Jinping, but but the regime's recorded on the economy. So it's just gaslighting, guys. We see this from the we see this from the Biden administration all the time. I mean, every week we see it from Karine Jean Pierre. I mean, we've had a nice break from the White House press briefings for a bit, mostly because they haven't done any. Uh, There's a press gaggle going on today, but uh, you know, it's all audio and stuff like that. But um. Thanks for hanging out with me. We do have a couple polls up. It seems like about 40% of our audience, maybe more, wants to have the show being premiered at 9 a.m. Eastern, 9 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. So that's what we're going to do. Uh, the show starting next week won't be spontaneous anymore. I'll get in the groove of things. Uh, work starts and all that other stuff. But uh, it'll be 9 a.m. Pacific Standard Time is the new show. Before we're doing 6 a.m. So three hours later. Um. I probably will put up an audio version of the show probably at 6 a.m. still. So if you want to catch it early, you can just go to Podbean and listen to it if you would like. Um, also, there was another announcement. I do have a second poll up, and I'm curious for those that actually watch Supernatural Saturdays. I'm thinking about obviously still doing the Bald Brad show, but it seems like some people get confused when they find my Supernatural Saturdays and they realize, oh, well, your main show is a political commentary show and it's Republican or conservative. Um, and they go, why, why is this on this channel? So one of the things is I think we're almost big enough to where maybe I could just move Supernatural Saturdays to a different channel and then do that on the side where I'm exploring that stuff either either every other day or every day or just on Saturdays or whatever. Um, 
Can you go over to that? Like, give me, give me your feedback on it. If you want Supernatural Saturdays to be its own channel, um, it wouldn't be called Bald Brad or anything like that. It'd have its own theme, its own name, and stuff like that. But um, let me know. Uh, I'm highly interested in doing it. I think it'd be a lot of fun, and, and it could expand out to me doing uh, investigations myself or partnering up with other YouTubers and doing investigations, things like that. So if you're if you're somebody that watches Supernatural Saturdays and that's something you're interested in, let me know because I'm leaning more towards doing it but i want to see what the poll says oh uh, with that being said uh become a member today there's a membership down there we'd love for you to join us we are a community of patriots here that love this country and only want what's best for it and uh, hit that like and subscribe button i'll see you tomorrow here on the ball red show